The death knell had sounded for the Richmond Vale Railway, the last commercial coal-powered steam line left in Australia. As part of Coal and Allied's rationalisation program within the industry, all 18 employees who worked on the line, taking coal from Stockrington to the processing plant at Hexham, have received retrenchment notices. But the planned closure alarmed many people, particularly steam enthusiasts. And in response to that pressure, Coal and Allied has offered a reprieve. The company says it's concerned with mining history in the region and that it now has other plans for the railway. Already talks have been held with officers from both the Newcastle and Cessnock City Councils to establish a trust. This would conduct a feasibility study to plan and administer the future operation of the railway for tourism purposes. The trust would be made up of representatives from Coal and Allied, the State Tourism Commission and the councils. In a bid to promote the trust's plans, the company will be looking for financial sponsorship for an annual steam day. Coal and Allied now will meet with all parties involved for more talks, aimed at keeping one of Australia's oldest operating steam lines on the right track. Adamstown Rosebuds in the red and green have been the form team of the 1987 competition and today at Adamstown Oval they showed the sort of play that's making them grand final favourites. In front of an enthusiastic crowd, the minor premiers scored three goals, one each to Warren Davies and David Bock, with Gavin McDonald putting this one into the net late in the match to wrap up the game 3-1. Bell Swan's score came from an own goal. Adamstown now goes straight into the grand final while Bell Swans play Austral in the final at Austral Park next weekend. Earlier in the day, in the under-18s major semi-final, Azuri and Bell Swans played a one-all draw, but Azuri took the match after a penalty shootout. And in reserves, West Walls N2 defeated Austral nil. Raymond Terrace in the black and white and Nelson Bay are familiar opponents in the grand final of the Lower Hunter Rugby League competition. This is the third year in a row they've met, but there was certainly no love lost in today's battle for the Jim Houston Memorial Cup. Nelson Bay were defending champions going into today's match, a game that featured hard and aggressive football from the outset. The Terrace scored first and that began a grand final winning points tally. The final score, Raymond Terrace 24, defeating Nelson Bay 12. In the Kelworth Cup earlier in the day, Tea Gardens 12, defeated Mount Hutton 8. In the John Dunn Cup, Katara 26, beat Shortland 16. And in the Keith Manning Cup for reserve grade, South Lakes defeated Cardiff 34-12. Kerry Bryan of the Combined Mining Unions at the Richmond Vale Railway told the 40-strong gathering at the Hexham siding this morning that such ideas were not practical. However, Mr Bryan said the railway should continue as a commercial coal carrier from Stockrington to the Hexham washery and produced figures he claims mean it's cheaper than road haulage. Mr Bryan said the only way the railway could be viable as a tourist attraction was if it was organised in conjunction with commercial coal carting. Well, it just couldn't happen. It'd be like putting a car in a garage and expecting it, leaving it there for 12 months, expecting it to go out, start it up and drive it to Sydney. It just wouldn't work. It needs a lot of maintenance and, you know, repairs to the line, everything else. Plus, along with, you know, with the locomotive standing in the shed, vandals would get in and more or less wreck the place. Another strong argument put forward at the rally was the environmental advantage of the railway continuing. Speakers said the impact of increased road haulage in the Minmai area would be detrimental to residents. That issue will be thrashed out at a public meeting tonight at the Minmai Progress Hall. Residents of the area say there's an agreement with the state government that Stockrington coal will be taken by rail. We've got an agreement with the government that while ever stocky pit is producing coal, 
that will haul this coal by the Richmond Vale Railway. And that's what we hope that they'll back up. The Richmond Vale Railway was idle today because of the mass stoppage by Northern Mining Unions. Retrenchment notices for the 19 railwomen involved at Richmond Vale take effect on the 25th. Loading in the port of Newcastle is expected to last only a week before supplies run out, with many buyers expected to switch to Queensland or even overseas suppliers if the strike, set to run until the 15th, is prolonged. This is a copy of the letter sent to more than 8,000 meat retailers across Australia. Gathering facts from medical authorities and health experts, the Australian Meat and Livestock Corporation and the Meat and Allied Trades Federation offer information to reassure butchers and their customers. The letter claims a safe and responsible system of testing food for pesticide residues is regularly undertaken by the Department of Primary Industry. The permitted level of pesticides is so low that it poses no threat to human health. The National Residue Survey shows that permitted levels are not exceeded in 99.6% of all beef sampled. In the 0.4% that is over the limit, the source of supply is quarantined or the product destroyed. And 35% of beef sold on the domestic market from export meat works is subjected to additional and intensified testing. According to General Manager of Maskey's Meat, Mike Maskey, the letter will help local butchers confused about the pesticide crisis. As soon as I heard it on the, on the press, I immediately started ringing people and finding out what it was about so that I knew the facts. I don't know that all the local retailers had the advantage that I did of knowing people who to ring. Um, so that's really why the letter went out, to reassure them of all the facts. What about the consumers? Have you noticed a, a downfall in trade? None whatsoever. Have they been concerned about the scare? We did get some phone calls initially but after we told him the facts, uh, there was no problems at all. Wearing his other hat as Vice President of the Northern Branch of the Meat and Allied Trades Federation, Mr Maskey says he now has no doubts about the safety of meat for domestic consumption. Very confident. There is not a problem. Four lives were lost when violence flared near Jaffna on Monday night. Ironically, a ceasefire agreement between Tamil separatists and the Sri Lankan army had only recently been made. Rohan Tisanaka was on his way to a prayer meeting with three Sri Lankans when Tamil gunmen sprayed their van with bullets, killing them all. But we have found out recently, uh, since the, the, the took place, that they had really intended to shoot somebody else and not this particular van load of people. So makes it a worse tragedy. Rohan was a minister with the Church of the Assembly of God at Gateshead. His close friend for the past 14 years, Pastor John Wolfenden, is in close contact with Rohan's 25-year-old wife Alison, formerly of Newcastle. She is still in Sri Lanka with their two children, Sonia, aged six, and four-year-old Nathan. Pastor Wolfenden says he will fly out to join them on Friday and bring Rohan's family back to Newcastle. He says the tragic incident has claimed the life of an effervescent and dedicated man. Well, he's irreplaceable. His personality is. Um, the person that he is is irreplaceable. We can uh, place somebody else there, but we can never replace the man himself. You know, The work will go on, but the personality has left us. We've lost that. How will you remember him? Very happily. Mm, indeed, very happily. To qualify for an MLC Junior Scholarship, the athletes had to be ranked in the top ten in Australia or top five in New South Wales in their sport. The scholarships were presented by Newcastle Lord Mayor John McNaughton and surfing personality Mark Richards. Athletes which receive scholarships today were Fiona McCarthy, Chad Stevenson and Tracy Blackburn in athletics, Peter Watts and Donna Proctor in swimming, Elizabeth Heslop, Linda Mooney and Cam N.G. in trampoline, gymnast Tracy Whips, golfer Wayne Stewart, diver Tony Lawson, cyclist Ashley Malcolm 
water skier Shane Pugh and canoeist Matthew Chalmers. In total, the grants to the local athletes were worth in excess of $20,000. In cash terms, they are awarded $900 that can be used for travelling, coaching, equipment expenses. This money is paid to the recipient's association. They then claim that money from the association. We then provide them with the tracksuits and t-shirts that you saw them wearing today, two of those per annum. And then we also run a sports camp, a three-day sports camp in each state. Every recipient is eligible to attend that. And in actual terms, the scholarship is worth about $1,500. Each year, about 2,200 Australian women die from breast cancer. That's about one person every four hours. And according to Dr Laszlo Tabar, a visiting Swedish authority in the area, this mortality rate could be reduced by about half if a quality screening program based on x-rays was introduced. Already plans are afoot to set up a pilot program in the Hunter Valley. And according to Professor John Forbes of the Mater Hospital, they hope to have it up and running by January if state government funding comes through. Dr Tabar is in Australia to take a mammography course for radiologists and is also collaborating on the design of the Newcastle program. He says Newcastle is an obvious place for a pilot program. What I perceive, this is an ideal place to start breast cancer screening. Here is the knowledge, uh, very good facilities and a very positive approach from the community. This year, almost 16,000 young people in New South Wales took up the tools of their chosen trade for the first of the four years it would take them to qualify as tradesmen or women. During that period, they will work on the job and learn part-time at colleges of TAFE. National Apprenticeship Week is held each year to recognise their special contribution to society. In Newcastle, the highlight of the week is the Apprentices of the Year Awards. The apprentices are chosen from 25 trade categories, ranging from panel beating to cooking. All attend technical colleges in the Newcastle area. The awards are very well recognised and along with the prestige of winning comes a certificate and a watch. Overall 1987 Apprentice of the Year was named Marlon Dalton, a vehicle painter who travels from Tamworth to attend technical college in Newcastle. Along with his watch Marlon also received $800 in prize money. According to Chairman of the Newcastle and Hunter Region Apprenticeship Advisory Committee, who hold the awards, industry needs to take a longer term view of apprentices. I think young people realise that there, there are still top jobs available for those that succeed in apprenticeships, and I think it's quite short-sighted that our industries are not training to the fullest extent. Fortunately, the, the uh, small numbers of indentured apprentices are being met by schemes such as group apprenticeship schemes carried out by Hunter Valley Training Company and Hunter Group Apprenticeship Limited. So you think it's wise to uh, build for the future as it were? I certainly do, that uh, there will always be a need for good trades people and uh, we're seeing some of the very best of them here tonight. I'm Janelle Provost. Newcastle's government bus drivers have threatened industrial action unless radios are installed in buses by December 1st. The drivers are worried about trouble on late night services, but the UTA says there's nothing to worry about and the radios will be installed within the next couple of months. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. The woman, Jill Mary Symington, was flanked by police as she was escorted into the Musselbrook local court yesterday. Mrs Symington stood charged with the murder of her husband, Donald Symington, a 43-year-old unemployed pensioner. 
Police allege that at 11.30pm on Wednesday, following an incident that day, and after long-running disharmony and alleged sexual abuse, Mrs Symington went into the bedroom of her house in Forbes Street where her husband was sleeping. She got a rifle and took it into the lounge room where it was loaded with three bullets. The rifle was then taken back to the bedroom where Mr Symington was shot. Police say the weapon was then placed on a couch in the living room under some cushions. Mrs Symington then went to the house of a relative who lived nearby. The prosecution urged that bail be refused because of the seriousness of the offence. Chamber Magistrate Peter Griffin said his main concern was with Mrs Symington's mental state. He feared what she might do to herself while on bail. Her defence argued she had been under enormous pressure for a long period of time. The trauma was over and she was relieved. She was reasoned and logical and not psychologically disturbed. Chamber Magistrate Griffin granted bail but attached a number of conditions, including that she not stay in her Forbes Street house where she might brood. The case was adjourned until the 16th of September. The prize winners in the BHP Schools competition were announced at a special dinner held last night at the Town Hall. The competition was open to students from all high schools in the Newcastle area. Entrants were asked to write an essay or do a project on one of several aspects of coal mining. The entries were judged by the Geology Department of the University of Newcastle. The judges decided the prize for the best junior entry should go to Year 9 Cardiff High student Andrew Rigby. Andrew was presented with a certificate by Newcastle's Lord Mayor John McNaughton. Andrew's win also carries with it an applicable prize of a coal industry tour, including a trip to central Queensland to inspect a giant open cut coal mine and coal loader. Highly commended awards were also presented for a joint effort prepared by Julie Giddon and Linda Bishop, both Year 9 students at Rutherford High. For the Gown of the Year parade, nothing is out of the question. The only requirement, it seems, is to be out of the ordinary and look very, very expensive. Indeed, many of the gowns cost in excess of $3,000, although one couldn't imagine too many orders flowing in for Barbizon anyway. The styles on show range from fantasy to classical wedding day wear. Despite their obvious differences, the gowns are alike in that they only appear on occasions such as this, most being one-off creations designed more for display than sale in shops. The Gown of the Year parade travels around Australia each year, stopping at major centres. In Newcastle, it was hosted by the Lions Club of Adamstown, who hoped to raise $5,000 from the event. The money will be donated to the work of Camp Quality, which helps children who have leukaemia or cancer. More than 300 children representing 19 schools from throughout the Hunter and Northern Tablelands took part in today's 22nd annual sports carnival. Amongst the athletes were 48 who competed in wheelchairs. The events were divided into two sections, one for the moderately handicapped and the other for the severely disabled. Besides the usual running events, there were sack races and plenty of other novelty races. There was a familiar face running the last leg for Maitland South Street School in the senior relay. Glenn Rose, who won gold at swimming during the recent Special Olympics, showed his versatility by almost helping his school take out the event. Point score champions today were Lakeside in the large school section and Francis Greenway in the smaller schools. Australia has 10 rescue helicopters, but this is the first time the annual conference has been held in Newcastle. The delegates are discussing search and rescue coordination, training manuals and standards, refining present helicopter procedure and looking at the service's future financial position. Those attending are also looking closely at the Hunter operation as it is unique in terms of its versatility. 
Well, the Newcastle helicopter service is very unique around Australia because of our multi-mission, multi-role operation. Uh, in Newcastle, we, we carry out, or the Hunter region, we carry out all types of uh, helicopter search and rescue and aeromedical work. And uh, in fact, it is the only area in Australia that uh, covers that full range. So everybody's over here to have a look at our operation and hopefully take some good ideas back. The Hunter service is also strongly community-based, which is not the case in other districts. The delegates are then looking at modelling community support for rescue helicopters on the Hunter's 12 years' experience. Prisoners at the Cessnock Corrective Centre went on strike on Monday afternoon. They refused to do many of the essential tasks around the jail, such as cooking meals, and furnished the administration with a log of 32 claims. Many of these claims, such as allowing fish and caged birds in their cells, appear fanciful, but others were more serious. Today, kitchen staff from the Allendale Nursing Home were once again busy preparing a cooked meal for the prisoners, as they did yesterday. The inmates were not due to meet with jail authorities until tomorrow. But in a sudden move, a meeting was arranged for 2pm today between the administration and prison delegates. Out of that meeting flowed a decision by inmates to return to work late this afternoon. The prisoners narrowed down their complaints to the central ones. These include dissatisfaction with the probation and parole service, the need for extra welfare officers and improved legal aid services. The superintendent of the jail, Joe Baldwin, has already sent letters to the appropriate people concerned to see if any of the problems can be resolved. Cancer patients from out of town suffer a stressful enough time with their disease without having the added concern of steep accommodation bills. But for many people there has been no alternative as they don't have relatives in Newcastle to stay with when they come for treatment. Today heralded a new era for these patients with the laying of the first bricks by NBN Chairman John Peshaw and Hunter Valley Cancer Appeal President Alwyn Holmes at the Mater Hospital. The units will provide accommodation for out-of-town oncology patients and their relatives while they are receiving radiotherapy treatment. The building will comprise of two wings with a central courtyard area and will have 16 motel type bedrooms with en-suites. The cost of the building is $850,000 which is to be funded from the proceeds of the 1985 NBN Telethon. According to Hospital Secretary Dr Ralph Watson, the accommodation is all part of the MARTA's increased role as the centre of oncology treatment in the region. What the MARTA will be doing is acting as the resor main resource and coordinating the treatment of cancer services right around the region and uh, we will be organising a completely comprehensive service in a coordinated way and this hasn't happened anywhere else in Australia.